Let's start uh, uh, today's lecture. Um, today's lecture we uh, discuss about uh, uh, some peculiar uh, peculiarity of of, uh, of robots, of fixed phase robots, that are mainly related to the fact that um, you might have more degrees of freedom in your joints than uh, the necessary ones to perform the task. This means you have a certain degree of redundancy. And the dual uh, topic is whenever in some configuration you lose mobility, you lose the possibility to move the end effector, then you talk about singularities. So actually, singularity and redundancy are the two faces of the same metal. In the case of redundancy, as we said, you have more mobility <coughs> than, than the one that you need. While in the case of singularity, you have uh, less mobility than you need. Let's see, let's think, for example, whenever we extend completely uh, the arm, um, if, let's say you have an anthropomorphic manipulation, and you have an arm, and you extend completely, then you lose mobility along the, the direction uh, of the arm. So, mm, oh. If you look at uh, what means having redundancy, uh, there is this, this video, uh, and you see that keeping, uh, this is a 70 degrees of freedom robot that uh, um, keeps the orientation and the position, so 60 degrees of freedom, uh, of the end effector constant, uh, and still is able to move his, uh, his joint in a, in a different way. Uh, and this helps the robot to achieve uh, different tasks, uh, like uh, avoiding obstacles, or improve the dexterity, because there are some configurations that are, uh, uh, require uh, uh, less torque than others. Or you can think there is an obstacle. So actually, this motion that you see is happening in the new space of the task because it's a motion that does not affect the motion of the effect in this case orientation and position uh, so what you said is a uh, random manipulator is a robot that has more degrees of freedom than uh, the dimension of the task and uh, uh, this additional degrees of freedom can be used to improve the dexterity. Uh, as I said, you can see here you have a 40 degrees of freedom robot and you have a task that is positioning in 2D plane the, the end effector and uh, the orient keeping the orientation. So uh, it's a 3 degrees of freedom task. Um, sorry, uh, 3, not 2. Um, and uh, the robot is 40 degrees of freedom, so you have this additional degrees of freedom that you can use, for example, to check another configuration that avoid to hit the to hit the, the obstacle. And the number of configuration of the null space is uh, it's the uh, difference between the, the task the, the robot dimension in the joint space and the task dimension. So in this case, we have infinite four minus three infinite to the power of one possible configuration that correspond to the same position and orientation of the end effector. So think about moving this <coughs> on the on this circle, this, this joint on this, on this circle. But um, how do we extend uh, our uh, inverse kinematics algorithm for a dominant manipulator? We anticipated this that in the inverse kinematics lecture and uh, we see that uh, what we use uh, in inverse kinematics, especially in the numerical um, one, uh, is the Jacobian matrix. And this Jacobian matrix is no longer square, so it becomes a rectangular. Because the number of joints is bigger than the task. <coughs> and uh, uh, the fact in the specific is that it's a fat matrix when the number of lines is smaller than the number of columns. 
um, to compute the, the uh, we cannot no, cannot longer compute the the, the joint correspondent uh, uh, position to the to an factor position using the Jacobian inverse, but we need to use another thing that is a generalized pseudo inverse uh, of the Jacobian. So pseudo inverse, um, it's a uh, we will see afterwards. It's a it's a, a an, it's like an inverse for a rectangular matrix. <coughs> And if we look at the um, at the space of the domain of, of of this Jacobian matrix, this Jacobian matrix leads uh, the domain of the Jacobian matrix. It's a space of the of the joint of the joint space that is bigger this time than the task space. So this is an effector velocity or the <coughs> velocity, and this is uh, an effector uh, joint joint velocity. Sorry, this is. Draw this in the in the blackboard because it's it's uh, quite important. Uh, the fact that, that the domain is bigger than the codomain belonging to Rn and this is belonging to Rm with n smaller than n. The fact that the codomain is bigger than the domain, uh, the codomain is, is smaller than the domain, it means that there exists a null space in the domain. And this is the mapping, the copy matrix that maps joint velocity into uh, task velocity. And this null space um, corresponds to joint uh, co velocities that do not produce any motion at the end of factor. And uh, the one that we see. While the uh, joint velocities, the component that of the joint velocities that produce motion, they are mapped to the range space of J. So this set has the same dimension of this set. So this set has a dimension n minus m. And this is a dimension of m. Clear? And this is called the row space. And the row space of J is perpendicular, is an orthogonal complement of the null space of J. And the dimension of the two gives n. So rho of j dimension of rho j plus the dimension of null of j it's n. Okay. <coughs> Everything is clear? So if you set a random joint, uh, and let's say you take a vector of joint velocities, whatever, you can project it into a draw space part or into the null space part. <coughs> if you use this, you project this into the null space part. So let's say you have a, I don't know, in your <coughs> secondary task, you want to keep the, the robot in a default configuration. But you don't want to affect the primary task that is keeping the end effector in a certain configuration position in a certain position and orientation. So you have this task that is projected um, through the root space projector here. And you will know that it will have no influence on the end effector. So there will be no conflict with the main task. But what okay. is the physical idea of projection in the space. So I choose joints. I have some particular value of joints, but 
I cannot decide if they produce motion or not. In the other factor? In the other factor. That's why you use the no-space projector. The no-space projector ensures you that uh, your task is represented by the Jacobian matrix. Because the Jacobian matrix, what does it do? It filters out of the joint velocity the ones that um, the, the, uh, the new space ones. So it, it will only uh, filter, it will only let pass the one that produces motion in the, in, the, in, the, in the end effector. And we discard the other ones. This doesn't mean that these ones don't exist. They can move the joint. Just the Jacobian matrix takes care only of the, ah, of the ones they, they that are they move the other configuration of the robot. I can move either elbow or shoulder yeah. without moving them. You, you will show the video that the, the, the joints were moving, but the end effect was not. So the, 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 the joint uh, velocities that are here, they will create a motion of the end effect. The joint velocity that are here will create a motion of the joints, but not a motion of the end effect. Mm -hmm. OK? Uh, while running a controller, how do we choose uh, the joint space, the non-space joint velocities, delta to zero? Do we do we choose the non-space joint velocities by running a controller or no? You can uh, you can set a task as I say whatever task here. You can, for example, delta Q. What people do is to is to select the delta Q to uh, keep the robot in a post default configuration, Q0, Q desire 0. So you want to create a controller that keeps the robot here, like this. But maybe this configuration, it's, uh, it constrains the, the end effector to be, to be here, while you want the end effector to be there. So, with this controller, you can take the end effector there and try as much as you can to, to go to the default configuration. So it will not choose this configuration, but this one. You understand? It's, it's, it's like what they call the regularization joints, regularization, right? Yeah, yeah, you could say you could say so. Yes, it's a kind of regularization to get um, a read of this and determinacy because none of these will affect the end effect of your motion. So you can choose whatever you want. So in, in summary, if you don't use the null space projector, what will happen? The road will arrive in a very difficult configuration to the other point, or? No, no, you, <coughs> it depends what you have, uh, depend, what do you mean, difficult configuration? Yeah, I mean, what if you don't use the null space projector? If you, uh, if you don't use it, then, yeah. uh, then, then you need to, <laughs> That depends. Um, if this is, uh, um, if you don't use it, then um, you get the minimum norm uh, solution. So you get a configuration that is minimum norm in the joints. Mm -hmm. So you, you can get a configuration that you don't like. Okay. Okay. Uh, but so let's say you you want to be here. I can be here this way, this way. Yeah. I don't like this way. I want to suggest. Uh, this way, because uh, I can push better yes. this way. Okay. My impedance is better at this point, in this configuration. So I suggest uh, a preferred configuration here, and you will select this. Otherwise, otherwise you get a minimum norm. Uh, you try to 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 be zero. So so that delta Q zero is like uh, an idea. Of the ideal configuration is what is that? Q0 delta, that, that term, yeah, could, what could be whatever you want, could be another task, could be uh, another configuration that you try to, to minimize the distance with another configuration, so that you prefer, it could be that you Push try on. to dump the velocity, it could be even something that is proportional to the velocity, so you, you try to simply from where you are, you try to 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 to, to, to dump the velocity. Great. Um, could be, yeah. In essence, most of the time is like try to uh, rec uh, have a postural task. It's called. It's uh, uh, what what people call the postural task. Try to to 
go in a default configuration that normally is, is nice in terms of uh, joint range mm -hmm. and uh, uh, also in terms of uh, manipulability. So it's like that the controller will find a position to reach that uh, desired uh, X that you want the task space by maintaining a similar configuration that the one that you're given, right? Yeah. Okay. Whatever you can. Whenever this configuration yeah, is related, it's possible. Uh, yeah. uh, of course, uh, wins the primary task. Okay. <coughs> um, and to understand, uh, so the, the, how does the uh, new space projector works? Uh, looks like uh, it's always like that. It's like uh, I minus uh, the row space projector. So this is the row space projector. We say that they are orthogonal, so the, the, their sum is it's uh, empty. Okay, do the full codominium. And this is the space projector. Why this is the space projector? Because you can think about uh, uh, first going here, okay? So you say that J filter everything from here and goes here, and then this maps back with J uh, certain verse maps back in the row space. So if you have something like uh, in here, doing this, you remove this new space part and you get the row space part. If you do I minus this, uh, it means that you are projecting in here, okay? And you can check this, uh, that this is true, because you, if you have a, if the new space of J, uh, if something lives in the new space of J, you should see uh, that uh, if you multiply for J, you get zero. And this is our motion, for example, that we were seeing before. Um, okay, as I said, we can uh, also increase the dexterity. We can say that we want high mobility, so we can find a configuration that has high mobility. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily the default configuration. We can do, yeah. Um, the same thing, uh, um, since we discussed about operational space control, uh, needs to be done uh, discussed also for the operational um, for the mapping on the, of the effect the of forces we know that the mapping of the forces it's uh, um, related with the uh, virtual walk work equation that relates the uh, contact for the extended effect of forces to the torques and uh, uh, for a data manipulator, uh, we have uh, the this Jacobian matrix is uh, uh, skinny. It's rectangular, but this time uh, the end effect of uh, it's n dimensional and the joint torques are n dimensional, so it's uh, skinny. It's called rectangular skinny. And uh, um, we can do the same reasoning uh, that we did for the velocities, uh, saying that uh, um, the torques at the joints uh, can have two components. Uh, one uh, are related to the uh, tor are the torques that generate <laughs> motion, as uh, generate forces at the end effector, and uh, a new space component that are the torques that do not generate any force at the end of that. And if we uh, um, draw the same thing, um, we have the kinetostatic duality, we have a very similar uh, drawing that then in the, in the case of the velocities, so this time uh, we have the uh, forces and the factor forces that live in Rm. Again, M is smaller than N. And we have the joint torques that live in a space of dimension Rm. Then, uh, <coughs> this time we have, we have the J transpose ma matrix, okay? that maps uh, uh, the forces into tau, okay? So that's like this. But, as we said, the, uh, the, the, this time the Jacobian matrix is 
at small row than columns, and an unknown space exists in the condominium. So this is the range space this time that has the same dimension of the of the of the, of the row space, which is M. And then you have uh, n minus m no space in the condominium. So this J transport will go here, inside here. But if we go back, we uh, use the J transpose cylinders. Okay? Okay. Range of J transpose, and this is no space of um, J transpose. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's uh, that's um, let's uh, skip this for now because it's confusing. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's a no space. Sorry, it's a no space of this uh, J transpose uh, cylinders. Then, um, so the new space torques, they pro produce no force at the end effector. The range space torques, they produce, through the filtering of jet force pseudo inverse, they remove the one that don't, don't produce any force at the end effector, and leave pass only the forces that, uh, only the, the ones that produce force at the end effector, okay? And this time we have uh, the two rows uh, uh, of uh, J, now it's, it's uh, the same uh, obtained from the uh, J-transpose pseudo inverse. But here shouldn't the arrows be inverse? Uh, what? From range space to the domain, the arrows for the J-transpose shouldn't be inverse or no? I mean, this is the range space of J transpose and, and is equal to the row space of J transpose cell inverse. So we are go going back exactly to the previous case. Now, how does, if I have a torque like here and I want to get the null space component, how does the uh, null space projector look like? I write it here. How does it look like? J minus J transpose pseudo inverse. J transpose pseudo inverse. All pseudo inverse. All pseudo inverse. J transpose pseudo inverse. Very good. That is simplified. J transpose, J transpose pseudo inverse. In the literature, nobody tells you this, they tells you this, and you see this, and you say, oh, they are different for forces and velocities. And no, they are the same thing. But you need to do all this reasoning. But sometimes you get confused because you don't know which one to use. And this is the same thing as this. So the, the way you build up the new space is always the same. And you, it, it comes up from the range space projection where you go forward and backward and you discard the range space part. Okay? Now, uh, how do we compute the universe? I want to give you a, 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 a mnemonic way to do that because all the time you, you will not remember unless you don't think about some tricks. So let's say we have, uh, we have a, um, a matrix that is packed, that's like this. I want to compute the, the, the pseudo inverse that should look like how? Skinny. Skinny, okay. Skinny. Okay. Uh, the idea is to um, make it square. Yeah, you need to, um, this, this um, we need to build up uh, a matrix a, a transpose somewhere, okay? So we need to, um, to 
But this matrix, we need to have a matrix like this and a matrix like this. Where a matrix like this is composed by um, this times this. Right? Because um, so, um, in essence, uh, if you if you if you want to uh, if you if you want to make this uh, matrix invertible, it, it should be a a transpose, because a a transpose it's right. a smaller matrix that is a dimension of the rank of j of a, so it's invertible. While if you do a a, trans, a transpose a, it would be the, the uh, a different matrix. It would be like uh, this, uh, which is a, a super big matrix whose rank is still uh, the rank of, of a, which is the full. Let's assume a is full rank pro rank now. So this is not invertible. So we need to necessarily for fat matrix. Do this, okay. So we do this. We done this. How do we get this? Um, this is something like this. Uh, I need uh, something like this, uh, and this is a transpose. Okay. So this is the we build up the the pseudo inverse for 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 fat matrix, for skinny matrix. Uh, ah, we need to verify. Um, is this a pseudo inverse? So. Uh, we need to multiply. Let's see. We, where do we multiply here to see if it, if it is absurd inverse? So yeah. inverse, if an inverse should be if you multiply the matrix for the inverse should give identity. identity. Mm -hmm. So where do we? What should we do here? Should I multiply on the right or on the left? left. On the left. Okay. Let's do it. A transpose A, A transpose minus 1 times A. Is it identity? Yes. Mm. A was transpose, A was one. Uh, so it, uh, uh, A transpose A. It should be in order, right? The middle terms. Middle term. B A the whole inverse is uh, and A B the whole inverse is B inverse A inverse. Yeah. So I did uh, yeah. Okay, sorry. So you have to flip it when to do the inverse? Yeah. Uh, same as transpose. Uh, yeah. yeah, minus yeah, A minus uh -huh. one A. Okay. okay. Uh, otherwise, you could also see from the other side uh, a a transpose a a transpose minus one, and this this is exactly uh, the identity. Yeah. Um, so, but here the left and right doesn't matter, as we saw. But why? Uh, it's. Uh, I need to think about that. Uh, I always thought this way. Um, I saw that works for your your for the other side. I will tell you next uh, next ah, section. Okay. Okay. I am probably uh, the other thing is not possible because it's not square. That is valid only for square matrices. The B A B whole inverse. Ah yeah yeah yeah. That's uh, that's probably the reason. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so yes. Yes. That's the reason. That's the reason. I remember that was that was. True, but uh, yes, the reason for which you could not do the other one. So actually, this is the right to the inverse, while uh, um, in the skinny case, you get um, you need to have um, the pseudo inverse, which looks like fat, and so. <coughs> get uh, the uh, not rank deficient inverse you need to do something like this so uh, this will be a trans um, 
Okay. So the output is like this. Um, then you have, uh, I, I said skinny, but I wrote the not skinny one, so I'm getting confused. Sorry, I'm confused too. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you, Raj. So, okay. <laughs> the the Ipsil inverse is um, it's fat. Okay. Now, to get something invertible, we need something. Uh, um, this, which is uh, uh, A transpose A. And then uh, to have this, uh, we need to have. Uh, a. Now, A transpose A. A transpose A, we get something like this. Yeah, and this is to be a transpose. So, um, the thing is this way it works. And this time, uh, this, uh, we need to left multiply to get. Uh, the identity, so it's called left pseudo inverse. But uh, these are a special case of, um, of uh, pseudo inverse uh, that are called Moore Penrose pseudo inverse because uh, ideally you could add, uh, for example, uh, a weight here, a weighting matrix, and you can uh, get infinite uh, uh, number of, uh, of pseudo inverses. Uh, Depending on uh, on the metric you want to you want to minimize. So if the, this W matrix uh, is it's, uh, it's an identity, this is what we assume for this course. Uh, mm -hmm. We will have the moore penrose universe that we just showed. And uh, if you want to use the generalized one, you 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 with a weight you put the weight like uh, the pedex substitute. Sorry. And which is uh, the point of having a weight? Uh, you can, uh, in essence, uh, uh, whenever you get, I told you, uh, you got the minimum norm solution, you, could, uh, you can get uh, a solution that it's weighted. So uh, it's not the minimum norm one. As the the Murper Rose gives you a minimum norm solution, but the, uh, another weight matrix could, you could, uh, for example, try to uh, minimize some joints rather than others, okay. more than others. So depending on the weight matrix, you you can get different solution. So um, then uh, about the singular configurations, um, we said that uh, as the singular configuration, we lose mobility um, in some direction. This is a simplest example of a singul uh, singularity. Uh, Boundary singularity, it's called. Um, and not only the uh, uh, lose mobility only the singular, singular configuration, but uh, uh, whenever we get close to the configuration, to the singular configuration, the mobility decreases gradually. So it's not just one zero; it's it's gradually decreasing till going to zero. And once in the singularity, the, then the factor cannot move anymore in, a, in some Cartesian direction. So uh, what, what, what do we, uh, how can we express this for a Jacobian matrix? We, um, we see that, let's say we are, we are talking now a uh, uh, 3 times 3, 3 degrees of freedom robot. And, uh, uh, a task, a position task of three dimension. Whenever the, let's say the the, the robot, this is the IQ leg, let's say completely extended. Whenever the uh, the robot is this configuration, then it loses mobility on the Z component. So it's like you having a, a row of zeros, and the rank drops from uh, uh, three to two. And this, um, this time, um, so uh, a singularity is related to a uh, loss in rank, and uh, the robot becomes a redundant manipulator because there are three joints, 
in a subdimensional space, in, a, in the orthogonal space to the singular direction. This is just um, some fact that you can see from this, uh, because now we have three and two, say. Um, the fact that the rank drops shows up as the determinant of the Jacobian matrix at the singular configuration was going to zero, and then also to the fact that there are infinite solutions to the uh, inverse kinematics problem. Um, and then close to singularity, you have, uh, because of, um, of the, the Jacobian gets E condition, because it's the ear determinant is started to get very close to zero, so you have a singular value that's dropping dramatically is going to zero. Then you have um, um, big uh, delta Q for small delta X. Why? Because if you uh, you have this matrix that is, is becoming a small singular value, then for a small um, for a small uh, motion, you get uh, to achieve a small motion, you need to do a big motion in the joints. So. And this is because the, the, this, is, this, this motion is related to the cosine of Q, and the cosine is very nonlinear, uh, close to close to um, So there are two uh, types of singularities, mainly, uh, I would say. Um, let's say the task is to control the position in the, of the unaffected in the space. What we just saw uh, as an example is called uh, um, bounded singularity, and it's called elbow lock. Uh, uh, and in essence, happens uh, at the extreme of the workspace. So um, let's say this is the workspace. Do you have the singularity in all this point at the boundary of the of the of the workspace? And uh, uh, so when the robot is in a stretched or a retracted configuration as well, you can get the, the opposite here. Um, and because of the extreme of the workspace, we can easily spot them and we can avoid them, just setting some uh, limits to the joint range. So we stay, if you stay inside the kinematic limits, we know we know, never get there. With IQ, we never get to the full extension of the leg, we just follow stop like five degrees before, so we never get there. Uh, the other ones that are the uh, sorry um, internal singularities uh, that are more difficult to spot because they are inside the workspace, and uh, normally they are related to the alignment of two or more axes of the joints. So think about, for example, a shoulder joint that is aligned with the, with the end effector point, and you want to position the end effector. You know that to uh, that position of the end effector, you can have infinite values of the Q1 joint that correspond to the same. So you, in essence, your, your Jacobian matrix drops rank in, in, in this situation. Also, you can have wrist lock. It's another situation in which you have, I don't know, for example, in a, in a six degrees of freedom manipulator, seven degrees of freedom, you have the wrist joint with these three degrees of freedom rotational ones put in this configuration, typically. And then you have this axis aligned to the axis of the last joint. So you can see that the same uh, uh, configuration, uh, an infinite number of, uh, of combination of Q1 and Q3 it's uh, giving, uh, resulting in the same uh, end effect configuration. So you have singularity also in that case. Um, so how do we uh, do? How do we do whenever you get? Uh, we have these singularities that we still want to, to control, right? We don't, unless we avoid them. One way is to avoid them. The other way is to uh, to deal with them. And there are different ways, and let's say uh, the, the, the all they rely on the idea of, of uh, dealing with the, with the rank deficiency of the Jacobian matrix. So uh, in the case uh, um, we saw before that you, you compute the, uh, the pseudo inverse, I told you that we assume that it's full row rank. In case of singularity, the Jacobian is not full row rank. So the idea is to, um, to add a, a, a dumping factor. So uh, let's say that the pseudo inverse it's, it's, um, 
is a solution to this uh, undetermined system that has uh, more unknown than equations. And, uh, um, <coughs> and in this case, there are the, the lack, lack, lack of equations because we have a row of zeros, so it's like we don't have uh, one line in our system. And then uh, the certain inverse gives the best possible solution to the, the, this undetermined system that is uh, like a, a minim the minimum null solution. So uh, it's above the, the above, along, along all the solution is the one that minimizes the norm of this quantity. Um, if you use uh, another uh, weighting matrix, it will be, uh, the, the, there will be a weighting matrix in, in the middle here. Uh, but the way to that to deal with the loss of rank of J and do the absurd inverse always possible is to add a term um, dumping factor that makes it this, that this matrix, the, the small one, remember, uh, invertible. So um, this will uh, it's equivalent to, to minimize, um, have a solution that minimizes this, this, uh, this cost, let's say, that can be written this way. So it's a regularization uh, of the joints. And uh, um, this is a trade-off between the least square solution and the minimum normal condition. Um, another way is to use a singular value decomposition. Singular value decomposition, it's a way to parameterize your uh, matrix. Your rectangular matrix in this case. J uh, using uh, two orthogonal matrix U and B and a diagonal matrix. And the diagonal matrix is made such that uh, as all the, on the diagonal all the um, singular value of J. Okay, sigma one, sigma two. J is M, okay. It's a, it's a, let's say it's a rectangular matrix like this. So rank maximum is M. Singular values M, and one of them, let's say, is zero. Mm. So whenever we um, um, want to uh, compute the pseudo inverse, we create uh, the pseudo inverse. It's doing the inverse of this matrix, where uh, V. You know, the inverse of an orthogonal matrix is, is the transpose. So V goes on the left, and uh, we do the transpose, so it becomes V. Then you have D inverse, so D minus 1, and you have U inverse on the other side, so transpose. And in this case, uh, the D matrix uh, will not be invertible, but we create a D uh, if, if, sorry, if the, there is no rank deficiency, the, the D matrix, being a diagonal matrix, will be, will have an inverse, like with the one ma over the first singular value, one over the last singular value, okay? Diagonal matrix. If one of them is zero, then we can uh, we can uh, define it to zero. We can we can uh, rather than that it will be set it to zero, and we uh, we manage to have a pseudo inverse removing the, the the smaller singular values, and this it's one of the best way. Otherwise, an alternative you can use uh, uh, try to use J transpose rather than J minus one, very close to the singularity, and this is uh, is proof that uh, for some appropriate scalar it, it provides. Uh, um, it provides convergence when you do inverse kinematics. Okay, do you have uh, any question? Let's see. <coughs> What's the time?
can uh, uh, now go back to the last topic, go to the last topic of the control of fixed base manipulator before going to floating base robots. And this topic is related to um, interaction, control of interaction um, with the environment. So um, why we want to control interaction forces with a robot? Um, first, we have many applications where this is uh, super important. And this uh, is, is, for example, whenever you have a robot that needs to interact with humans, safe robot interaction, assistive robotics for elderly care, uh, then you might have surface uh, machining uh, that involve, for example, polishing, the burning, uh, and brushing. Or you can have mobile robots, legged like robots, that to work with the environment will always have contact and they will need to balance. And wearable robots like as skeletons, that, that some are, are, are robots that. Uh, the human needs to uh, wear to uh, perform, uh, for example, power augmentation task, pull up loads, and, uh, and even to uh, rehabilitation for paraplegic uh, people to walk. So there are many applications in that field. And of course, the robot doesn't need to be stiff and hard the human in that case. Uh, uh, other, so the objective are to apply, avoid to apply uh, forces that are too large, and also for, for example, when you the robot needs to handle a fragile object in pick and place um, um, tasks, and uh, uh, whenever you want to control the interaction force, for example, whenever you want to the legged robot needs to balance uh, to avoid uh, losing balance, needs to be a slippage, needs to control the contact forces. To uh, control the interaction, uh, there are um, several methods. Uh, one big group uh, are passive methods. So uh, many people, for many years, uh, there was a, a very uh, uh, ongoing trend of putting springs inside the robot structure. Actually, in series of the Twitter, uh, physical springs were introduced between the robot and the environment to um, control the force, and they were called serious elastic actuators. So you put a spring in series of your motor, and you have some compliance. The problem of this approach is that the compliance cannot be changed. Uh, you need to model it, uh, and, and also becomes a, 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 a uncontrollable dynamics. So you cannot uh, really do much, uh, increase the bandwidth, uh, the force control bandwidth too much, because you have a limit due to the uh, physical spring in the system. Um, however, it's because it's a physical spring, uh, has no delay in applying the springiness, so it's stable, uh, it's more stable um, than uh, uh, an active method where you're using feedback control techniques to emulate virtual springs, uh, uh, virtual compliance at the end vector or a uh, contact point. In particular, uh, the feedback control techniques, uh, they can be, for example, direct force control method. We will see that it's uh, an extension of, of our operational space control. Uh, so you map, um, you close the loop directly on, a, on the force measurement, and you, you have a feedback on that. And, uh, the problem is that the force measurement first you need it, then it's um, it's, uh, it's noisy, the, 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 the measurement can be noisy, uh, and uh, you also have a problem of non-collocation. So whenever you have a song compliance in the middle, as I say, that due to the structure compliance between the actuator and the, and the point you want to control the force, in case of force control, you can have problems of instabilities due to this non-collocation. Uh, while in the, in the case, um, the other big group, it's the group of, uh, indirect force control, uh, where uh, people try to control both the force and the position at the same time. And this big group for the uh, approaches of compliance control and impedance control. 
And these approaches are more flexible than in the passive case because you can change actively online the stiffness via software. So I can stiffen my, my arm in a few milliseconds and uh, softening whenever I get in contact for some reason. Um, and this is, uh, this is very, it's very practical in, in, in nowadays because, for example, a legged robot that it's walking and it's it's, uh, it wants to uh, have a big tracking, a nice tracking, so it starts to be stiff during the swing to, to nicely track the swing leg trajectory, while whenever it's touching the ground, uh, it wants to reduce the gains uh, and become soft because then we have another controller that we see in the last lectures that kicks in and controls the stability. So the controller. The problem with this approach is, uh, shortcoming is that uh, the controller delay influences the maximum bandwidth you can uh, control the force. So if there are big delays, you will see that uh, we are not able to emulate uh, nicely the impedance uh, for, for a big rate of frequency. So in particular, you can check my PhD thesis. I did this analysis uh, mm, for electrical motors. And in the case of um, uh, if you have a transfer function of, of a, uh, an impedance ah, yeah, like this way, okay, uh, which is um, uh, you see that uh, this is the desired impedance you want to emulate. But then, then uh, due to the controller delays, maybe you are able to, to go up to here, then, then it does like this. It's not able to, to track the, the desired one. This is a bot diagram uh, where you have uh, this uh, transfer function. Uh, Uh, as you said, the most famous uh, direct methods uh, for force control are impedance control, for example, that uh, they want, they, they, there are some implementation uh, uh, with position loop, but most of them mostly require an inner thought loop. So, uh, and admittance control that I will not talk because of uh, time, that requires a, an inner position loop. So, in an impedance control, in essence, you have an outer loop an outer position loop, you have impedance control, then you provide a torque desired to a torque loop and here you can have a inner torque loop in a cascade Providing talk to the robot. So uh, in general, talk loop. It's a, a like a, you have an integrator inside. You don't use derivatives because the, the force derivative is quite noisy, um, and you can have feedback linearization if your actuator is strongly nonlinear, like in the case of our hydraulic robots. We, we do. PI with uh, feedback linearization. So it's the same idea of inverse dynamics, where you invert the dynamic calculator and you use a PI to control the torque. There are plenty of papers from our lab in this, this topic back 2013-12. Um, so a quick uh, a quick explanation on the um, direct force control idea. Uh, direct force control, as you said, we measure the contact force. <coughs> If this contact force is smaller than the desired one, we want to apply more force. If it is uh, bigger than the desired one, then we want to apply less force. Um, to do so, uh, we can do with a feed forward desired force plus a, a narrowing force times a proportional gain plus some uh, possibly integrators, we say, uh, that help. Um, then we use the same uh, um, 
same idea, similar idea to the operational space, uh, control whatever we we were having a tracking of, of the position, the orientation here. And so if we replace this control law uh, in the dynamics uh, and you look at the steady state, uh, we see that H becoming G. Uh, we have uh, we have this term that goes on the left and the Q dot dot goes to zero, then you have tau. Tau is, is this, J transpose F star plus uh, some gravity compensation. So in essence we have F equal to F star, uh, where F star is F D plus K F error on force, and then you if you if you if you port on the left side you can see that the error goes to zero, the, the steady state the, effort, the, the force error goes to zero and you achieve the force tracking. Um, instead, the idea of uh, uh, impedance control is to uh, indirectly regulate the forces at the end of factor by generating a motion at the end of factor that satisfies a dynamic relationship between the force and position. Uh, that is impedance actually. So we try to emulate to move the end effector in accordance to the contact force such that uh, the end effector emulates a spring damper uh, and the mechanical impedance is it's, uh, something like this. So you have uh, an inertial behavior, a damping behavior and uh, a stiffness behavior. So let's say you are this is your desired trajectory for the end effector. This is the position, and you get an external force, and you will have that position will move in a in a springy dumpy fashion, and also showing some inertia. Uh, so uh, the mechanical impedance gives an idea of how the point of a system, in depending whatever you define it, uh, moves if you apply a force to it. And this is very similar to operational space control, but it's different and we'll see why. Because the external force enters in the equation. Um, so if we consider a position control only, we want to control position no matter what force is applied. By force control only, we want to control force no matter which position is achieved. If uh, position control, you would try to achieve, uh, to, uh, to increase accuracy, you, you crank up the gain, uh, then you end up with big contact forces that in the end uh, cause a Twitter saturation and breakage of the mechanical parts. Something in the middle, it's some idea in the middle would be as a, um, to use agri control, so to do force control in some direction and position control in another direction. This was done uh, back in the, in the 80s from uh, Siciliano and Katib as well to uh, try to, for, for machining, so they try to control position in the perpendicular direction. Uh, to the to the machine surface and um, and uh, so in the tangential direction to the machine surface and the force in the normal direction, but requires that you constantly define this frame of uh, force control direction and position control direction, which is not very practical in practice. Uh, the other idea is to use uh, uh, impedance control. So there's something in the middle between position. Uh, let's quickly talk about causality. You have uh, most of um, uh, mechanical uh, objects in the in the world. You know, they are masses, and this means that uh, they accept a force as input and gives a, um, an acceleration, a motion, uh, velocity as output. And all the inertial objects uh, uh, are like that. The, the, this is an impedance behavior. While an impedance behavior in general gets a motion in the, in the, in the, in the input and uh, provides um, a, a force in the output, like a spring, no? A spring you, is like... If you do the spring is uh, delta uh, x, sorry, f is equal to delta x, but if you do at the velocity level, uh, it's kp, uh, v, so x dot, dt. So you have an input velocity, and whenever the velocity is inputting, the force builds up and increases. 
in the input velocity will integrate and in our deformation of the, of the spring. So you have an input, the dynamics of the spring as an input uh, motion velocity and uh, as an output uh, uh, the force. Uh, to interact with the environment, uh, the robot must behave as an impedance because we can, for causality, we cannot connect two emitters together. Um, so the idea is to control the robot motion such that if, you give, uh, um, if there is disturbance, the disturbance response for a deviation from the, the motion as a form of an impedance. Uh, one feature of impedance control that we don't have in operational space control, where we saw that we achieve the 0.1 unit mass behavior only at the end effector, is to uh, shape the inertia uh, at the end effector. So uh, the idea is to mask the true inertia of the manipulator and uh, impose uh, desired inertia at the end effector. Um, so the idea, we are, of course, we are not changing the, the manipulator inertia, but we are masking it such that at the end effector will appear uh, an apparent inertia that is the desired that we want. So we can uh, you know, still make, increase the inertia in some direction, decrease it, or make it isotropic if the original inertia is not the inertia that's all the or the manipulator map at the end effector. This is mostly the case. Uh, for example, as I said, uh, I can make the, the end effector uh, inertia in a configuration dependent, so that it's always uh, uh, um, constant. Uh, the other feature is that I can easily superimpose impedances, because impedances are linear, uh, uh, linear dynamics, so uh, we can sum them, we can so, uh, apply the superimposition of effect uh, theorem, and then uh, we can get, um, um, for example, each impedance can represent a task. For example, I want to move the arm, and I want to, uh, I want to keep the, the central mass uh, in a position, and the, the behavior will be a compromise between the, the two tasks, uh, if they are conflicting, of course. Um, impedance can be implemented, uh, impedance control uh, both at the, in the joint space and uh, at the task space, so uh, in the joint space implementation, uh, we define the impedance this way. We will have the desired uh, external, uh, sorry, the external uh, torques, the external force that manifests itself in, uh, as a torque at the, at the joint level. Um, and we have the desired uh, um, uh, inertia uh, matrix, uh, damping, uh, uh, and joint space uh, thickness. Then, if you have the, the dynamics, that will have, uh, as you said, the uh, external force like that. Then, uh, what we do from the desired impedance, uh, we uh, work out uh, the um, accelerations that correspond to the motion that we want. So, let's say we have M. <laughs> Theta Q dot dot plus um, D theta Q dot S Q dot plus K theta Q S minus Q. And we work out the acceleration inverting the inertia matrix and then we plug this uh, acceleration uh, inside uh, and uh, of course we are missing the sorry, external forces which is super important We plug this in into the, the dynamic equation where we have tau, let's say tau x uh, plus h, and uh, in essence we we get uh, a tau that has this shape. We try to. Uh,
so if we put the tower like this uh, in here um, this is the inside one then we do this and my Q design plus H minus tau x in here we replace in essence this term we get this expression and uh, uh, you can see here that uh, if you are uh, reducing a lot the, um, the desired inertia uh, we will have uh, the inverse a big matrix and so we will need uh, a lot of torque to 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 reduce to make the the, the uh, robot behave with a smaller inertia um, in addition we also need the uh, measurement of the external torques uh, for tax space impedance control uh, this is some experiments these are some experiments that we did back in 2012, we were changing and adjusting the stiffness online and the damping online. We see that with low damping, we were, we were having a, a, an undamped behavior because the damping we said was lower than the critical damping value. And in the case of an impedance uh, at the end effector, uh, the, the Cartesian impedance, we were doing the same as this is the joint space. So we define a desired uh, the vector impedance, desired Cartesian uh, stiffness, and desired Cartesian uh, damping. And this is our uh, external forces. And if you use the, the dynamics uh, with the same, uh, uh, same approach, we uh, this time, uh, uh, rather than uh, um, using Q dots, desire that we need to find uh, um, the relationship between uh, D and the factor uh, acceleration and Q the dot. So if you have uh, mx x dot dot plus uh, dx x dot f minus x dot plus kx x minus z minus x equal to external fx then uh, we get uh, our desired behavior for the acceleration that fulfill the uh, dynamic relationship that you want that looks like this when you have dx desire minus x plus minus kx x desire minus x minus uh, plus fx so. okay then through the uh, Jacobian uh, second order kinematics we can relate uh, uh, x des to q dot dot des plus j dot q dot and we can get uh, q dot dot tens equal to um, j minus 1 x dot dot tens minus j dot q dot and, and this is what we give to into tau and we will have uh, this expression and we see again that <coughs> we have the same problems of uh, Amplifying the torques whenever we set a small uh, impedance, we have the problem of singularity that if the robot gets in a singular configuration, the, the, the torque will be infinite, we are not able to control. And also, we have this uh, cancellation. The cancellation, as before, we before we were can cancelling the Tau x, we directly here we can sell the tau x as well, this is the same as tau x. 
And we know that there is a problem with the exact cancellation because an exact cancellation might not be possible uh, because of the model inaccuracy and also measurement inaccuracy. And as I said, there, there are big talks on indeed if the, um, if the inertia, desired inertia that we want is more. So uh, this approach requires a torque group, so torque sensor at joints, uh, and a force sensor at the end effector to measure the text um, and plug in uh, uh, the, the, the both torque uh, control uh, action into the dynamics. We can see that we have we achieve, achieve perfect, uh, uh, a perfect behavior, uh, the perfect impedance emulation that we want. So we see that given a, a, an external force, our robot will give away uh, with a certain inertia and a certain spin and up coefficient. But because of all this uh, uh, shortcoming, uh, uh, the, this approach is not really used in practice, and uh, in general, only the uh, KB and KX term, uh, sorry, the DX and the KX terms are used. Um, this is the, the, the plot I showed you before. Uh, of the, the cascade with a loop with an inner torque loop, and uh, uh, and this is uh, this formulation of course is equivalent to a PD control in the task space. Doesn't need any torque of contact for sensors, and it's okay if the inertia of of, of are small, so the, our stiffness will not be such influenced be influenced by the by the inertia. And uh, uh, it's passive if the uh, uh, stiffness and damping matrix are positive definite. Um, passive means that uh, the system is always stable whenever it's interacting with a passive environment. That is normally always the case. Then uh, uh, I will show you uh, uh, afterwards uh, some passivity uh, slides. Uh, we can even uh, think to add the desired force. Uh, uh, together with the impedance, this is to, for example, in the case of uh, the burring or, or cleaning task, when you want to keep the contact a certain desired pressure on the on the, on the point, uh, then you want to you want to do that. And finally, uh, we can we can show some differences because you might ask. So, what is the difference from a, a normal PD control? Uh, in the PD control, we summarize control only position. Here, we control the relationship between position and force. In a PD control, KP and KD gain have no physical meaning. Uh, so, for example, normally you have the error position, this is the valve opening, uh, for example, an hydraulic actuator uh, or a voltage, and, and these are, are just gains that act on the voltage. While, uh, um, while in the impedance control, KD have a physical meaning of stiffness and damping, so with a SI unit of uh, uh, Newton of a meter uh, and Newton. Uh, Per second of the rad. And what is the point for me that the KPA has a meaning or not? What does it change for me? Sorry? So, what is the point for me that I'm choosing a, which kind of controller know, to know that KP and KD has a physical meaning or not? Well, it's, it's, it's preferable, right? I prefer to, to know that this is uh, like a springiness of. of, of, of uh, 300 and Newton meter from, a, from a of tuning. Yeah, for tuning it, it simplifies. For example, working on a soft terrain that you might be used to like. Yeah. Those kind of parameters. Yeah, you, you can estimate the, the soft terrain parameter and you can set in your impedance, some impedance that is, is consistent with the, with, the, with the terrain parameter. And also, uh, this, um, this, this kind of approach is very stiff in general. While here you are, uh, you have a torque loop inside, so it, it can be very compliant. It's very difficult to have to have a compliant uh, uh, controller with this kind of approach. Because it's very it's very reactive. There is no inner loop. Um, and of course, uh, with an inner loop, you can implement straightforwardly all the control load that you find it now, because. We always gave a control of tau, so all the model-based controller that we can think of, they are easily implemented if you have an inner uh, joint-level torque loop because you provide the torque reference and it will take care of tracking it.
so in a position control there is no torque loop in here you have a torque loop and uh, uh, position control uh, doesn't care about disturbances try to deject them while uh, uh, an impedance controller try to be a controlled response to the disturbances from the environment and that makes the robot appear as a physical system um, but what is passivity? Uh, there is a restatement of the energy conservation principle. Um, from the, a system is called to be passive. It can store more energy than is supplied uh, from the outside, so it doesn't uh, generate the energy in internally. And uh, in <coughs> general, um, as we as we said, um, a passive element, uh, it's all a passive controller is always. Uh, it's a feature of being always stable uh, whenever it's interacting with the passive environment. Because if you have a you write your controller, everything seems to be nice, then you try to use it and you get in contact, it can happen instantly, bah, 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 gets completely unstable. And this is because of the passivity, uh, non passivity of the controller. Because the controller, yes, it behaves like a spring and damper, but it has some internal dynamics some actuator dynamics that make it not passive because the, the passivity, the, 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 the spring itself is an active uh, spring that is achieved through, through, through a feedback loop so you really have, if you analyze, you can see this, this in my thesis my PCB thesis there, you can see that, that there are some values of the delays uh, due to the filtering for example or some values of uh, inner bandwidth of the torque loop, for example, that can break passivity. And the robot can uh, start to have problems whenever it gets in contact with its own environments, not, not all of them. Uh, and so if you ensure passivity is always a very good thing because you forget about problems and you, you know that, um, that your, your, your system will be stable during the interaction. So in general, uh, as we said, um, we cannot set whatever gains uh, in our controller and in our impedance uh, because we might uh, break the passivity. So this, this in general, you need to do a kind of analysis. You do an analysis on the set of gains that you can set for which the system is passive. So you do an offline in general analysis with a, with a whole complex model of the robot and you get a region which we call the stability region. This is good to do, uh, where you have, uh, uh, for example, you can have some areas uh, for which uh, the system is non-passive and some areas for which the system is passive. So rather than uh, uh, getting crazy doing trial and error, you, when you go to the robot, you try to set uh, uh, a set of a uh, couple of parameters for the stiffness and damping that are uh, inside the passive region. And as we say, these regions are strongly dependent on the uh, sampling time, on the filter friction, on the bandwidth of the inner top loop, and also on the bandwidth of the filter. If the filter, they are valves that are very slow and produce delays, you, you forget I mean, it, it, the region of possible uh, uh, no, uh, 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 parameters that uh, for which the system is passive become very small. Okay, if you have any question. I, I have a question. Uh, in uh, one of the formulas, we had j dot uh, q dot, right? Yeah. Uh, so the numerical impactors in the numerical computation of j dot is as straightforward as uh, computing some derivatives, or how do you do that? So, it's very uh, not advisable to um, to compute J dot with numerical derivatives because um, they are error prone and they are they need time to be computed. So normally the term j dot q dot uh, is computed through spatial algebra. We know that uh, this is the uh, equation uh, of the acceleration of a point, uh, right? Uh, and we know that if we set 
in the computation of this acceleration. Let's say we have a function that computes acceleration of the end effector, and we set uh, q dot dot to zero, we will have uh, the output that is equal to this. Mm -hmm. So in 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 in, in, um, in, in practice, uh, people use the uh, forward pass of the uh, of the uh, twist um, propagation in the, the spatial algebra to compute uh, the this term. So you will never compute J alone, you will compute always J Q dot together. This, that is in essence what you need. So you 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 you, you, you call this function is very fast. This twist propagation is go through the link and propagates uh, add the, the twist uh, due to the motion of this joint and you get the final uh, the factor twist. And if you if you set the acceleration to zero you can get only this term. So this is what uh, people do in practice. Other questions? So if there are no other questions, we can continue with the lab. Break. Uh, the second lab that is on... Break before the lab. Ah, sorry. Yeah, first the break. That's two 15 minute breaks. And then whenever we, we are back, we, we do the second lab that is uh, on the operational space control strategies that we presented yesterday.